Hello everyone and welcome to my long belated Doctor Who bottom 5 stories video. Now this video isn't just about slamming these bottom 5 stories and I've drawn them from the classic series and from the new series. I genuinely believe that every Doctor Who story has something good in it. And these bottom 5 I score around a 3 out of 10, so it's not like they're completely irredeemable. As well as telling you why I don't like them, I'll be telling you how they could be improved and maybe a bit of information about the production to explain how these stories went a bit wrong. Without any further ado, coming in at number 5 we have The Curse of the Black Spot. Yo ho ho, it's a terrible episode! Now, Matt Smith's performance as the Doctor is pretty much flawless across his era, but he is saddled with quite a few turkeys in my opinion, and this is one of the worst he gets. My big problem with this is it takes a very interesting concept, the idea of the alien medical AI being unable to treat humans, but it doesn't feel logical to me that the AI would know how to keep humans alive without knowing how to treat their injuries, or that the AI would not be able to tell the difference between a cut on the finger and someone drowning, especially when you consider that the bodies of the alien pilots we see, well, they appear to be corporeal, so presumably they bleed at some point, and the alien medical AI should be able to work out, oh, bleeding, I know how to treat that. Okay, I, th I, I understand. Good, because it's not like that at all, but if that helps. Thanks. Now, some stories we'll come to later on the list were beset by production problems, which kind of explains some of their flaws. But Curse of the Black Spot was actually a story moved up in the season to replace Night Terrors, which had production problems and was moved further down. That leads to another problem, because the first half of this season had little cameos from Madame Kaverian looking through the hatch to find Amy wherever she is in time and space. So one of those scenes had to be inserted into this story. The scene it replaces is a scene where one of Avery's men is abducted. Which means we have a character who just disappears from the action halfway through the story. Now, he's a secondary character, he's a minor character. I can't even remember the character's name, but I remember getting to the point where he's suddenly not there anymore, and I noticed he wasn't there, and I was really annoyed that that, that hadn't been explained. I just find it ridiculous that we can set up even a minor character and just have them disappear. I guess what it boils down to for me for this one is that this story shows contempt to its audience in not explaining its ideas clearly enough and in just having a character disappear off screen. The performances are fine, it's just that the script needs more work. I'm confused. Yeah, well, it's a big club, we should get t shirts. Coming in at number four, The Space Pirates. This features one of my favourite Doctor and Companion teams. My favourite Doctor, Patrick Troughton, and Jamie and Zoe. But they can't save it. This story is not great. There's some good performances, especially from the villains played by Dudley Foster and Lisa Danielli, but then on the other hand you've got characters like Milo Clancy and General Hermack with their ridiculous accents. Go on, Clancy. Over the last two years I have lost five floaters carrying Arcanite ore back to home planet. So I feel bad saying that about General Hermack because that's Jack May and basically that is his voice. That is what he sounds like. But all of his underlings, the other sort of space police if you will, act in a far more naturalistic way. What is our arrival time? Even with that moustache. Still 90 minutes to go sir. We are going to be too late again. But the big problem here results from something that had become an ongoing problem with the series, and that is Patrick Troughton was getting ready to leave, but he was finding carrying a series where he is the lead and they're making 40 half hour episodes a year very, very taxing. So various concessions were made to him in this season to reduce his workload. Some episodes were made shorter, but on this occasion instead what they've done is just had the Doctor, Jamie and Zoe not actually involved in the action that much. They get sort of shunted from room to room, cell to cell, spaceship to spaceship, kept prisoner here, kept prisoner there. In the last episode they're not even in the studio, they pre-recorded their material because they're off shooting the next story, the War Games, which is much better. But we're not being taken on the journey, we're just kind of being dragged by the hair because the Doctor, Jamie and Zoe really don't have that much impact on the plot. Now, the plot itself 
Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on, as I said, the villains are interesting, but it's a story about people stealing rocks and minerals from each other. <laughs> it's a worthy idea, it was 1969, the space race at its height, and so we wanted to go out into space, the model work is gorgeous, but the execution of the rest of the story? Oh, it's pretty awful. Just floating hopelessly in space. Yes. Oh dear. We're going on a journey for number three, Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. There are two big problems with this story for me, so let's start with the title, Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. So that promises us that we are going to go into the TARDIS. Now we can count on one hand when we've really explored the TARDIS in the classic and the new series. We've got stories like The Edge of Destruction, The Invasion of Time, Castra Valva, Doctor Who the Movie. In the new series we haven't explored the TARDIS that much. We've seen the wardrobe in The Christmas Invasion and we've seen some really quite nice corridors in The Doctor's Wife. So. I was so excited for this story, so maybe my disappointment is because my expectations were too high. But the problem I had with the TARDIS interiors in this is they just weren't that interesting. They were kind of a set of generic space corridors. They looked like the Enterprise D from Star Trek The Next Generation. The design wasn't actually bad. It just wasn't exciting for me. Even those corridors in The Doctor's Wife, that really wide hexagonal shape, kind of reminds me of the Liberator from Blake 7. But I found that interesting because the TARDIS is this huge expanse of space. You can fit anything inside it. So you have these impractical corridors with these really wide walls that you can't actually get anything down. It's not like a sort of wide freight corridor where you could wheel a gigantic trolley or drive a car through there. It's quite cramped but quite big at the same time, so I really like that design. Whereas these corridors are just cramped. Where's the space in the TARDIS? Despite that, the story doesn't feel claustrophobic to me at all. This, this could be an opportunity to make a really scary story, as they try to in The Edge of Destruction back in 1964. Now of course, 1964, two part story, you're not going to do that so much. Read the novelization of The Edge of Destruction though, if you get the chance, or listen to the audiobook, and there's a real sense of menace from the shadows in the TARDIS. Even Castrovalva manages this. Invasion of Time? Maybe not so much, but even there you've got the juxtaposition of the high tech TARDIS console room and the brickwork of the TARDIS interior. But Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS actually doesn't fail because the design works bad or because the budget's bad, but because I just wanted more imagination. Really, I just wanted more imagination. Even that scene in the engine room, oh, the, the TARDIS is powered by a big glowing ball of energy. My other problem, of course, is the three guest cast. Now, not the actors, but the characters of the Van Balen brothers. You all know the twist I'm talking about, and if you're not, you might want to go watch this episode first. But it's revealed that the youngest brother is, in fact, under the belief that he's an android. The twist is that he's not an android which he finds out when he gets some, I shouldn't be laughing, impaled through the shoulder. <laughs> Tiwana Kai is in a synthetic voice box. But you, my friend, are human, flesh and blood. It was a joke. I get that it's meant to be this big dramatic reveal, but... It's just hilariously bad. It doesn't help that these characters have been designed to be unsympathetic, so we don't particularly feel any sympathy for uh, Tricky's plight. I should stop laughing now. But just as a twist, it's so stupid. I can't, I know it's a an inversion of when you usually find out a character you think is human, is a robot, but, it just fails to land here, especially because the story at the end is kind of given the magical Voyager reset button, which to be fair, they do call a big friendly button, but that means that Tricky now doesn't find out that he is actually human. And we're given a little inkling at the end that maybe his brothers will treat him a bit better now, 
but that's pretty horrible. So we have a not terribly interesting story with three really unsympathetic characters who learn something in one timeline, but then of course are hideously killed. And that means they survive, but they don't learn anything. Um, is this Doctor Who or Seinfeld? For number two, The Celestial Toymaker. This story is set in an illusory world run by the Toymaker, and it'd be remiss of me not to at least mention that the Toymaker is a white actor dressed in a Chinese Mandarin outfit as a villain. We also have a character who drops the N-word just casually in the background of a nursery rhyme. Even without those, this story really just kind of fails. And the reason for that is we are in an illusory world. The toy maker likes playing games with people. If you lose those games, he turns you into one of his toys. The games we come up with are an obstacle course, musical chairs, dancing, find the key, and a board game in an illusory world. Okay. Part of the problem with this story is that inside these games, which Steven and Dodo have to play to win the TARDIS back, the only reason these games last as long as they do is that Steven and Dodo act like idiots. They trust the toy makers' toys despite being betrayed by them again and again uh, before coming to the conclusion every episode, oh, we need to not trust them, and that's how they get through the game. No, he's bleeding, he's hurt, he's what we can't do. Take your <laughs> Hey, that's red ink! Of course it is! You're so easy to fool you are! Now you can go back to the start. The other problem is William Hartnell is sidelined as the Doctor. He's a disembodied hand throughout most of the story playing a game with the toy maker. This is because the producer John Wiles didn't get along with William Hartnell and was trying to write him out of the show. And the toy maker turns the Doctor invisible. At the end, he turns him back we get William Hartnell back, but the original idea was that it would just be a completely new actor, but playing the same role, playing the Doctor in the same way. It wouldn't be a regeneration, it wouldn't be a new version of the character. Now, the bosses at the BBC quite rightly said this wasn't on. <laughs> you have been defeated. But the big problem with this story is, in this world of illusion, we could have anything. We could have anything happen. And the original script that writer Brian Hales was creating, he had to stop working on because he was terrifying himself. That is what this story should be. This story should be terrifying. It should be playing on fears. It should be taking the symbols and tools of childhood and turning them evil instead of turning them into a slight nuisance. We get a glimpse into Dodo's past at the beginning of this story, which is tantalizing because Dodo is a notoriously underwritten character. We see her on the day her mother died. Now there's your in for this story. The toy maker using memories against you. We already have Carmen Silvera in the story as various female villains. What if she had been a nightmarish version of Dodo's mother? And that's Dodo's game. To replay her childhood. Against a version of the woman she misses the most. When we meet Stephen, for the first time. He has been imprisoned by robots for over a year. Put him back there. That is terrifying. Make these characters confront their fears and immediately, as soon as they overcome those, they are empowered instead of being stupid as they are in the games earlier. Now, I'm not sure how to fix the Trilogic game section of the story, but maybe actually have William Hartnell there bantering with the toy maker so it's not just Michael Goff talking to himself. This is a story with terrific potential that is just wasted because the production team were afraid of being scary. And Doctor Who should never be afraid of being scary. Ah! It's only me, Cyril. Before we get to number one, I'm going to go backwards through the Doctors that I haven't mentioned on this list and just mention what is my least favourite story for each Doctor. 
So for the 12th Doctor, it's Sleep No More. Skipping over Doctor 11, because he's had two entries, we come back to the 10th Doctor, and my choices fear her. For the 9th Doctor, this is a tough choice. It would probably be the long game. Okay, now the 8th Doctor is going to be hard, because he's had two televised stories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of his audios, because that has Paul McGann in it. And that is The Creed of the Cromen. Another hard one for the 7th Doctor, it's Silver Nemesis. For the Sixth Doctor, this one is easy. It's the Twin Dilemma. Yeah. Doctor number four, I'm gonna go for Underworld. For the Third Doctor, I've had to choose one of the few direct sequels that the classic series has, and that is the Monster of Peladon. So eagle-eyed viewers out there may have noticed there was one Doctor missing when I went backwards through that. It is the Fifth Doctor. We're going back to season 19, story five, Black Orchid for my number one worst Doctor Who story. Okay, let's talk about the positives of Black Orchid. It's the first pure historical Doctor Who has done in about 15 years. It has beautiful design work, great costumes, an excellent location. Episode one has some great scenes between the regulars where after a series of really quite dark adventures, they get to relax and have fun. The dog, he gets to play cricket, making sense of the costume he's chosen for himself. Oh, well done. Tegan gets to watch the cricket and aliens, Adric and Nissa get to be confused by the cricket. So everyone's kind of catered for in that scene, sports fans and non-sports fans. Then things start to go wrong with this one. So the central concept of this story is you have this country house, which is the seat of the Cranley family. And uh, the Cranley family had two sons, one of whom was an explorer who went to the Amazon to find a special flower. And that flower is the Black Orchid. He does find it, but a tribe who worship the Black Orchid torture him, disfigure him, and he comes home a broken man. Now, first of all, we've kind of got a colonialism narrative there, which fits the 1920s setting. But the first problem the story has is it never works to critique that. It never works to critique the fact that this character has gone into someone else's territory, someone else's home. Now that is not to say any character deserves to be tortured, but there's no mention of that. So pretty much we have a character who through torture has become mentally unstable and unable to communicate and he is regularly tied to his bed and locked in his room. This character, George, his main motivation is to see his fiance again, to try to communicate to her what has happened to him. At one point, he takes her to his room, lays her down, she's asleep because he's just killed someone, she fainted, but he puts her to bed, which is nice, I suppose. And then he just sits with her. Now, that could be seen as creepy, but also, He's been seen as a murderous character, but he is not a rampaging monster. He has reason, he has emotion. And what happens? He gets locked up again. I forgot to mention, by the way, Anne is a direct double of Nyssa, the Doctor's companion, but this is never explained with any sort of sci-fi conceit. It's just, oh, they look the same, let's move on. <laughs> no one attempts to explain that, but it's a pretty good performance from Sarah Sutton, so I'm not gonna complain too much about that. We've also then got the fact, right, that the Cranley family, led by Madge, led by the mother, locks this son up in the attic and gives away his fiance to the other brother. Anne was engaged to him. But I'm delighted to say that we're still going to have her in the family. If Charles marries the right girl. <laughs> now, the moral reprehensibility of Madge doesn't stop there, okay? In order to cover up for the fact that her son is murdering the servants, She's quite happy to pin it on the Doctor, because what George does in order to get into the party, he steals the Doctor's costume for the party that the Cranleys are holding. So when Anne, his fiance, comes to, the Doctor is blamed, because he's now wearing the Harlequin costume. That's who attacked me! It's me! Yes, you! So Madge is perfectly happy for the Doctor to go to jail 
for her son's actions. The only character to object to any of this is actually Anne. When Anne is told later on, she's furious. She runs out of the room. Oh, how could you? Now, this all culminates when George escapes from his room again, this time by setting the house on fire, which, you know what, honestly, you go for that. And kidnaps Nyssa, thinking that she's Anne. Nyssa! So this, of course, leads to the Doctor and George's brother chasing him onto the roof, and the Doctor has to convince George that Nyssa is not Anne. And he does this by pointing out, look, Anne is down there, so you can see there are two of them. Now, this is a big concept for someone to get their head around, right? That your fiancé looks exactly like this other person. But George accepts it. George is still intelligent. He's still in there. Yes, he has gone through a terrible ordeal. And yes, this has made him unstable. But he is not insane to the point that he is a murdering thug. George is then accidentally killed by his brother. He's knocked off the roof. And it is played as an accident, it is written as an accident, but it is incredibly convenient for the real villain of this story, that is, Mother Madge, that she totally just gets away with it. George is dead, she doesn't have to worry about him anymore. At the end, everyone's been to the funeral. Doesn't seem like Madge is being arrested, despite having hampered a police investigation. And Madge is responsible for at least four deaths. We've got two servants, we've got Daitoni, and we've got George's death as well. But the big problem, okay, and this story could have been saved. This story absolutely could have been saved if the Doctor said anything against Madge's actions. Literally anything. All he says to her at any point is that if George realises that Nyssa is not Anne, he could hurt Nyssa. He doesn't mention you locked up your son. He doesn't mention you're responsible for these murders. He doesn't mention you treated your son poorly when he needed love and help. He doesn't mention pimping out George's fiance. He's just given George's book on the Black Orchid and says, I shall treasure it. And that's the end of the story. This story is just, it's, it is morally reprehensible. It's a midsummer murder in Doctor Who, which is not necessarily a bad thing. The unicorn and the wasp does it really well. But where's the morality in this story? You know, we don't need the sci-fi concept. We've thrown away the doppelganger idea, but you know, Doctor Who throws away ideas we expect it to explore all the time. That's fine. But where is the call out for how poor George is treated in this story? I <laughs> just... Oh. The writer Terence Dudley also wrote Canine and Company, if that gives you an idea, which is pretty terrible. But he wrote Four to Doomsday as well, which is flawed, but it's still enjoyable. This... This is awful. It's awful. It has a beautiful first episode. Don't get me wrong, the first episode is beautiful. But the whole thing just falls apart. Every other story on this list has some kind of redeeming factor. You can see what they were trying to do. You can see what they're trying to go for. Black Orchid just doesn't try. It does something the BBC are already good at. It does costume drama, which is fine. But Black Orchid, for me, is the only story on this list which is actually offensive. Other stories are a bit contemptuous of your attention and just expect you to accept what things are happening, but Black Orchid actually invites you to side with a manipulative villain who, having found out her son is tortured, chooses to torture him a bit more. Black Orchid is morally reprehensible and it is my least favourite Doctor Who story ever. I may have gotten a little bit carried away just then, but <laughs> thank you so much for watching. Have I included any of your most favourite stories on my list, or would you like to tell me your bottom five Doctor Who stories? Please do so in the comments below. Now, my next video is going to be, as highly requested, 
on the Dalek video, and thank you very much for your feedback on that. It's going to be the Cyber Stories ranking, and I actually prefer Cybermen to Daleks, so this is going to be a lot of fun for me. In the meantime, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and ring that little bell so you get notifications when I upload a new video. Until next time, thank you again so much for watching, and uh, why don't you go watch some of these bottom five stories and really, really torture yourself. And lock up Madge!